Um, it, is a, um, it is an absolute thrill to, uh, to be here presenting to you today. What I'd like to do is um, introduce you to, um, I'll call it Innovation 2.0, what I think is a really big idea. And let's start with um, a little bit of backdrop. So the world just got much smaller um, in, the, uh, uh, in sort of the timelines of uh, humanity, the last five to 10 years has been absolutely extraordinary. In fact, it's changed so quickly, most of us don't even realize. For the younger people in the room, you've grown up with technologies and tools and connectedness that, um, you know, quite frankly, you know, most of us in the room remember the first time cell phones were introduced. The world's gotten much smaller. We have instant communications, internet, satellite, cell phones, SMS, Twitter, um, and these new capabilities are rolling out each and every day. What's important is it means we're now in a connected world for the first time in human history. Things happening anywhere in the world are communicated to everyone in the world instantly. That means the world has a voice of its own. In addition, individuals have their own voice for the first time in human history. Anyone in this room, uh, in fact, people from this room may very well Twitter while we're speaking. Uh, you can create websites, you can blog, you can belong to social networks and engage with people all over the world who you may know or may not know. So not only does the world have a voice, you've got a voice. Kind of interesting. Now all of a sudden, we're living in an instantaneous on-demand world, which is both several and individual at the same time. And it's global everything. So also, very recent history, for the first time, we have access to truly global markets, manufacturing, distribution, which means whatever creative idea you have, right, can go to market in a matter of months. When a shoe manufacturer can open up in Portland, Oregon, completely outsource to brilliant product designers a new set of shoes, have them manufactured and show up ready for distribution through retail outlets, within 45 days of launching the company, you have a truly, truly new world, and that's the world we're living in today. There's also this notion that humanity is going through um, an unbelievable and an unprecedented change. Traditional borders are now imaginary, right? We don't operate the way we did 30, 40 years ago. Humanity is now more than the sum of our parts. We work together in ways we never did before. People work across borders. They collaborate on projects in ways they never did before, often with people they've never met, thanks to the new communications technologies and the internet. We're empowered in ways that we never imagined previously. That doesn't mean the entire world is caught up, but it will be caught up. So humanity 2.0, if you will, is this notion that we now have a human voice, right, in this sort of ubiquitous, ubiquitous global world. It does mean that our people, our customers, partners, and seven billion people all have a place at the table. And now innovation 2.0. Right? Innovation just got connected. We're all used to the notion, well, actually many in this room may not be used to the notion. In traditional innovation in large corporate uh, buildings, you might have 7,000 researchers sitting inside four walls doing things their way, the way they always did, uh, looking at innovation coming from the sources that they've traditionally looked at for innovation. This room tends to, uh, I can tell the last two days, tends to be highly inventive and creative, often thinking outside the box, but that is not the traditional mode for innovation, as you well know. Let me ask you this question. What if you asked 100,000 people what will make a difference in their lives? What if you asked 100,000 people to give you input on what product you should design or take to market or the next video you should create? My guess is um, you would get an incredibly rich set of responses back from the people that you asked. My guess as well is that this is a brand new concept. Traditionally, people, you don't really ask your markets. You don't really ask your customers. You invent for them. But in this sort of brave new world that we're in, everything changes. Now you need to be engaged with um, your constituents. What if they answered you back and you listened and now we're creating better products, better ways of life for people based upon what everyone in the world had to say about what was important and how they'd like you to engage with them and what they'd like to do. What if you asked 100,000 people to help you in the process, right? Who out there might actually have a set of skills that we can apply to a problem that matters? Who might be able to work on this in different kinds of ways? And I don't mean just ask finding 100,000 people and picking out one or two that might have a set of skill sets that I think can help with that innovation. I'm talking about asking all 100,000 people. 
right? And what if they actually came and they made a difference? And now you're inventing products and curing diseases and improving qualities of life, right? But you were doing it because you asked the people in the world what mattered and you got everybody in the world involved with actually creating solutions. And maybe not thousands. What if you asked millions? Why not, right? Everything changes in this sort of, you know, you know, humanity 2.0, innovation 2.0, world 2.0 world. Why? Because everything is different. We've, we're seeing things now that are absolutely unprecedented. And I'm going to say as well that it affects your world, right? In the product design space, in the innovation space, we have examples coming left and right. Whether it's Ducati creating motorcycles, but it's not Ducati anymore. They're being designed by their customers, their best customers. Or, you know, Lego blocks essentially being created by kids. They're not rolling out new sets of Lego blocks anymore based upon what their market demographics tell them. They're listening to the people that use them every day, creating the next set of products based upon the people that use them every day. Right? You've got companies like Starbucks elevating it to an entirely different level. Right? Starbucks has had an uh, incredible amount of economic woe the last two years. Founder comes back, and what's the first thing he does? He puts up on the website, you tell me what we need to do to be a better company, right? Depending on where you are in the world right now, you may not get a receipt anymore when you go to Starbucks, right? You know, if your bill is under $25 US, why? Because their customers said the Starbucks I wanna go to wouldn't waste paper. So you know what? They don't print receipts anymore. Their whole brand and product persona is being reinvented by their customer. So you know what? It affects product design as well, particularly when we look at the holistic views and the red dots and the things we've been talking about for the last couple of days. So I wanted to introduce you to Innocentive, um, my company. And I thought instead of me introducing you to my company, I would let our users introduce you to our company. So um, I invited our user community to create a commercial grade video to really, in their voice, introduce the company. And this was really designed to, to ask other users to join them in sort of the common cause. Here's the video that was created by our network. Now more than ever, the internet gives you greater access to the world than any other medium around. But you're a problem solver, whether by nature or profession, and when you view the world, you see problems awaiting that perfect solution. Your solution. You're tired of the voyeur seat and realize that the time is right for you to reach out. You're ready for the internet to bring you to the world. Innocentive does just that, connecting real world problems to the world's wealth of brilliant solvers like yourself in a competitive, open, innovation platform. On our website, not only are you competing for the substantial cash prize awarded every winning solution, we here at Innocentive understand that for solvers, there's an even greater reward, having a positive impact on the future. Become a solver today and help make tomorrow a better place to live. Innocentive's mission statement is, is an easy one, and I'll just read you the first sentence or two. Innocentive will change the world and influence the lives of people everywhere by applying our planet's human creativity and intelligence to solving the most important challenges facing commercial, government, and humanitarian organizations today. Our job, we are actually a for-profit, but we also do an enormous amount of work with not-for-profit and sort of global good kinds of causes. I'm going to go through some of those today. Our job is to essentially connect innovators, brilliant people, creative people all over the world with the problems that matter. Think of us as the eBay of innovation, right? Our model connects problems from organizations that we call seekers, innovation-hungry organizations. They need a new product. Uh, they need a disease, can a disease cure candidate. They need a new way to, uh, to recycle materials with what we call solvers. These are brilliant, inspired people from all over the world who can be anyone. Anywhere, everyone in this room should become an innovative, innocentive solver. We connect them, but we don't connect them one to one. What we do is we take the problem and we use an inducement, an economic prize, $50,000, $100,000, doesn't matter. And we essentially use that to induce the network to work on the problems that they may be able to have a unique ability to work on. It's all done with a secure online process. We protect the identities um, 
of the parties involved, or if they're, it's in the non-for-profit space, it's all public. And we do this in a way that's secure and proven, and we've got eight years' experience doing this. So let me give you uh, one page of the theory. That's all I'll do today in terms of the theory. Uh, but, but have you all heard of this term, the long tail, right? So um, for those that haven't, Chris Anderson termed the long tail. He was really getting at why, um, why an Amazon.com or an online retailer really had to win at the end of the day um, in terms of bookstores competing against, against bricks and mortar bookstores. And here's the rationale. A bricks and mortar bookstore really can only afford to stock the best sellers and a few other books. Turns out most of the books sold in the world are every other book, right? So the only way as an online, the only way that you can really win at the end of the day is as basically an online virtual retailer because you can stock every book, right? Those are the books that are purchased. So the long tail, if you will, represents all of the books that are purchased all the way down to the very last one. And as a bricks and mortar bookstore, you can stock very few. Well, we talk about the long tail of innovation. Here's the idea. You know, you probably, as a company or an organization, uh, you may very well go to um, the best schools in the world and cherry pick who you think are gonna be exactly the right people to solve your problems, right? And you might have a pretty good hit rate. But I think people in this room, more so than other audiences I speak to, know something that's very, very true at the end of the day. Something a lot of the, uh, the smart people in those labs don't want to admit. Most innovation doesn't happen where we think it's gonna happen. It happens on the boundary. It happens when backgrounds and experiences and things intersect areas we don't anticipate. So it turns out organizations are reasonably good at innovating, but real innovation, real breakthrough innovation is usually happening somewhere else. So the long tail of innovation says, look, maybe as an organization, what you want to do is actually staff a fair number of people. That's fine. Call them innovators. And you might even work with other companies. But the long tail says, if you can get access to everyone else in the world that may be able to work on your problem, you're richer still. Harvard and MIT and a lot of other schools do a lot of analysis on incentive, And they do it because we're an open company. We make our data um, pretty public. And they have had some absolutely intense findings looking at our data. The first one is um, innovation really does happen where you don't expect it. So they looked at, um, they looked at years of innocent of history, looking at companies and non-for-profit challenges and things that we've run in our network. And what they found was in very few cases was the breakthrough uh, solution. Did it come from the field in which anybody would think it would come from? Right, and I'll give some examples in a minute, uh, but a problem with uh, recovering oil in subarctic waters. It was a construction engineer that had the inspired idea on how to do that. Very seldom do things come from exactly where we think it should. The second thing that was really interesting from the Harvard study was this. Why on earth do people do this? Right, why would you spend so much time trying to help an organization innovate? And it's interesting, we've got an economic prize um, that we offer in every one of these cases, but you know what? Turns out the number one reason that people innovate on our network for other organizations is they wanna work on problems that matter, right? And this will come up again in a few minutes when we talk about things in the uh, foundation in the global good space, but they wanna work on things that matter. As a human being, that's really inspiring to me. Second thing is they wanna be recognized, right? You wanna be part of a global community that solves really hard, hard problems. And the third thing is you care about the money. Every study that's been done, and there have been multiple studies, every study that's been done on an incentive has found that users do these things, they do these things because they want to work on problems that matter. So the world is watching. This has been something very chronicled. In incentive, if you haven't uh, heard or read about us, we're in about 130 different books. We've been on BBC, NPR, all over the world. We're really kind of the poster child for an area known as crowdsourcing. Right? The notion that the crowds are a heck of a lot smarter than any one of us by ourselves. And organizations all over the world are using, they're adopting this approach. On the commercial side, organizations like Procter & Gamble and SAP and Byersdorf and companies all over the world. These are examples of some of our customers. As importantly, what we're doing on the not-for-profit side, we work with the Rockefeller Foundation, the Global Alliance for Tuberculosis, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and others, really trying to get people working on, again, the problems that matter. If you were a solver coming to the Innocentive website, uh, what you would do is you'd come in and try to find things that you can work on, right? Things that inspire you. 
So if you came in, you might look under business and entrepreneurship. You might look under physical sciences and see challenges for liquid level detection. You might come in under engineering and design, uh, where somebody wants to uh, design a new outdoor wireless networking technology or low temperature improvements in adhesives. You might go to the public policy and citizens in action pavilion, where the city of Chicago is looking for new ways to incent people to use public transportation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Chicago. Right? You might go to the Global Health Pavilion. I just mentioned IAVI, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, where you'll see the first challenge on the list is a $150,000 prize to help with a crucial area of research uh, involved in finding an AIDS vaccine. So when you look at all of this, then you have to ask the question, what is this global network? Well, this global network is 170,000 strong today. Now, this is not Facebook, okay? 60% of the people on this network have PhDs or masters. They're in 220 countries. We have brilliant creative designers, videographers, members of the Russian Academy of Sciences. They're all there. They want to solve problems that matter. They sign up. They're engineers, researchers, designers, entrepreneurs. They're people that work. They're students. They're retired, right? They want to continue to exercise their craft even though they're retired. They want to give back. And there's unprecedented diversity in the network. That's the key. What did we just talk about the long tail? That's a diversity story. I also uh, went ahead and had the, uh, the team run the numbers um, uh, because I knew I would get this question. What's the participation um, uh, on this continent? Today there are 1,200, well, at least as of last night at 7 p.m., 1,289 solvers uh, and in fact one winner. About half of those solvers are from here in South Africa and the one winner to date was 2007 from here in South Africa. But I will tell you this, there should be thousands upon thousands of solvers here in South Africa, considering the number of, or here in Africa, considering the number of challenges we run to help people in this part of the world. So it's underrepresented. I'm gonna now make it a personal goal to see if we can't make that number tens of thousands, if not millions. So could this approach change the world? We think it can, we think it absolutely can. So let me give you some examples. This is the fun part of my job. I, if you can't tell, I actually love my job. So 1989, I promise you this story. Exxon Valdez spilled. Has everybody heard of the Exxon Valdez spill? Right, a huge um, calamity. Uh, it's a monstrous oil spill uh, off the coast of Alaska. What most people don't know is there's still 80 thousand barrels of oil sitting on the bottom of Prince William Sound, right? It never got cleaned up. And the reason it didn't is you're in subarctic waters. So the water is not frozen down there, right? But you get above the water level and you know what? It's pretty darn cold. So they can't, they have a very difficult time pumping this very viscous kind of sludge-like oil through the barge system. If you can't pump it through the system, you can't pump it out of the bottom. So since 1989, when the Oil Spill Recovery Institute was founded by government and the big oil companies, they've been searching for a way to get oil to flow through these systems so they can get the rest of the oil recovered. Well, as part of this process, they put a challenge on the Innocentive Network. I think it was on the order of $20,000. Uh, we ran this, I think, uh, last year. Uh, I believe we ran this. Ran for about four months. And solutions came in from all over the world and they were phenomenal solutions. The winning solution came from a construction engineer um, in the central United States. And what he suggested was that keeping oil liquid is a lot like keeping cement liquid as you're pouring a foundation. Same problem, right? It wants to get solid, but you're not ready for it to be solid yet. So he said, why don't you take construction equipment, off the, off the shelf construction equipment that they use in the cement applications that vibrate the cement, right? You won't let it Pardon. Make some modifications to it, which he designed, drop it into the barges, and you're going to keep this oil liquid as you vibrate the liquid. They are now rolling this out, right? Be they are now getting ready to pump the oil off the bottom of Prince William Sound. And here's the beautifully human part of the story. He takes his $20,000 prize, flies himself to Cordova, Alaska, because he wanted to meet the people he had helped, and now he's doing pro bono work for them, right? That's the stuff that's inspiring. Proving our children's future. So this is a project that we did with Asset India. So there's an estimated seven million young women in prostitution today in India, and they're subject to exploitation, slavery, abuse. Um, really, we're living in a world there where um, 
uh, particularly in rural areas, poor rural areas, there is so little um, by way of paying jobs that these young women really have very little in the way of choice. So Asset India, um, who really focuses on using technology to help people in India pull themselves out of that poverty, or at least to give them choices, said, wouldn't it be great if we could create a solar-powered wireless router technology? Why? Because then we'd have a very easy way to install little points of presence for the internet in villages. These young women could work for home, getting paid you know, to do work over the internet information processing. They would be safer, they would make more money than in the sex trade, and in effect what you would do is improve their lives enormously. So ran a challenge on InnoCentiv. The challenge was to design this solar-powered wireless router technology. Um, all over the world, designs came in for how to do this. The winning solution um, uh, won for a number of reasons. It's technical merits. It also recognized what uh, materials would be available to actually construct these solar-powered wireless routers. Um, this is being uh, set up for prototyping right now. Uh, testing will begin in September of 2009, but promise is very high. Asset India is also working with other organizations to set up the internet links into the villages. Once these are in place, coupled with other programs, inexpensive laptops, et cetera, uh, there could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that now have alternatives they would have never had today. And you know who we have to thank to that? We have to thank the solver, but we have to thank everybody, right? Because again, this is about engaging everybody in the process. Thinking outside of the box. So the Barr Foundation, which is the second largest nonprofit foundation in the United States, and the Cambridge Energy Alliance decided that if, uh, if we were to really help big cities decrease the size of their carbon footprint, one of the big things that you've got to do, particularly in certain areas of the world, is to create a much lower cost, energy efficient air conditioner technology. And what they recognized was the importance of having the cost be so low that people would be economically induced to switch, right? Switching costs. And if they did that, and it was a much lower energy usage, then the city, the country, as a people, we would all be better off. So um, as uh, many of you probably also know, it probably doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out, and we do have rocket scientists, by the way. There's been almost no innovation in the air conditioning industry in 20 years. Why? Right? You put one in, it's yours. Unless it goes out, you're not going to buy another one. And the air conditioner companies are pretty comfortable with the status quo. Well, two solvers, John Barry and Dr. Norbert Muller, were awarded $30,000 for the cooling technology they created. Everything I'm showing you is in the last several months, right? That I'm giving you real-time information here. They looked at the designs, but this was the most innovative design of all. This used a whole set of filters and water channels and evaporative uh, technologies. You know, when things evaporate, they tend to cool. And this should be such a low-cost mechanism for air conditioning that the price of putting an air conditioner in would probably pay for its replacement in a matter of months, not years. So this could be transformational. So right now they're prototyping this, and if that works, then they'll actually roll it out to air conditioner companies who they hope will pick it up and start to put this into production. Truly ingenious solutions. We worked with an organization, Sunite Solar, and this was also founded by the Rockefeller Foundation, to see what we could do to find some innovative ways to slow the spread of malaria. So 300 to 500 million cases of malaria each year. I know many people in this room don't need to be told the statistics, but there's immense societal and economic costs. As you well know, you can't stay indoors all the time or under a net all the time, and the chemical solutions are, um, have their own set of, of issues associated with them. So the challenge was, what can we do with solar energy? You see a lot of solar energy prizes these days. To produce a device for under $10, that would kill, repel, repel or sterilize the female mosquito, stop the spread. And talk about out of the box thinking. Everybody in the world that was looking at this price, price thought that this would be what's called an active solar solution, meaning using a solar cell or a solar panel. The winning solution was actually passive. There were no solar cells involved. So get this, you're gonna take a mound of wax that stays outside during the day, picking up all the heat it can, right? And turns out it can hold that heat for quite a while. And there's a reservoir in there. And so the, uh, the person with the, the, the device 
wears a sweatband around his or her ankle over the course of the day, which picks up his sweat. So it turns out there's two things that really most attract mosquitoes in the, uh, in the evening hours when the mosquitoes are most likely to bite, and that's the human heat signature and the human chemical signature, mostly coming from sweat. So this wax device picks up the heat during the day and becomes the hot sort of bullseye in the home in the evening. And because the person, I don't know what it smells like in here with this whole sweatband thing going, but the, the sweat is, is uh, before going to bed, the sweat is essentially squeezed into this uh, reservoir and there's a facility there for catching uh, and trapping the mosquito. So it looks like the cost of producing this is dollars, right? They're testing this, what a brilliant idea. I mean, if you can actually do this, then this could be built anywhere in the world for almost no cost. And these are the kinds of ingenious solutions where you do ask yourself, you know, why hasn't anybody else thought of this? Well, maybe we haven't had enough people working on the problem. That's what we're trying to do. And I'll give you one last example, and this is one of my favorites. So um, tuberculosis research, one of the most promising drug candidates is a drug candidate called PA824. Existing, the existing manufacturing process for this is incredibly expensive for a number of reasons, which I'll explain. All that you really need to know here by way of background is that when you're putting a drug candidate through the approval process, you've got a second job you have to do, which, which is even if it gets approved, I still have to be able to manufacture it. The cost of creating a TB drug is too high. It's never gonna be distributed in the areas in the world that require the drug. So the Global Alliance for Tuberculosis um, asked us if we would run a challenge and really try to get our entire network um, involved with solving, uh, solving this problem. So here's the perfect storm. PA824 as a drug requires uh, uh, three synthesis steps to create, which is very expensive. That's one. Two, the materials you use to make it are toxic to anybody involved in the manufacturing process. And three, they also are explosive, right? Your lab blows up. So that's a problem. So two winning, uh, two winning proposals, and together these proposals actually solve the problem. One came from India, one came from China, and um, this is extremely promising. So if PA824 is approved, they now have a manufacturing route, which will allow this to be distributed in countries throughout the world at an extremely low price. I always love the human angle. Here's the human angle. So the Indian solver, and you can look at this stuff on Innocentive's blog, a lot of our solvers and particularly the nonprofits write their stories, document their stories in the blogs because they want people to see them. The Indian solver whose background is impeccable, research scientist, doctor, everything you'd expect for somebody to be able to solve a problem like this. His, he remembers, he talks about in his blog posting on Innocentive, he remembers growing up and his mother got TB and he remembers she couldn't work and how difficult it was growing up. So you know why this guy did this? First of all, he's got plenty of money. He didn't do it for the prize. He did it to make a difference. And again, that's what this is all about. So this is just the beginning, okay? We think this basic approach actually is changing the world. What we need to do now is get more and more people engaged on a global scale because we think it's geometric. Look what we're doing with 170,000 people. What could we do with 170 million people? Right? What disease cures could we, could, we, uh, could we further? What could we do in the way of everything from, you know, you know, you know better building materials to, you know, really increasing uh, avenues for, you know, allowing people to prosper in, in areas of the world that need it. So we do think this is just the beginning. So I just wanted to ask you, I wanted to do, this isn't get ready to clap for me. I wanna, I wanna prove to you all how easy and fast it is to get on the same page, to work on problems that matter. So I'm just gonna ask you to do an experiment for me. Uh, some of you may have done this before. I want you to start clapping randomly. Not yet. Start clapping randomly, and I wanna see how long it takes you all to start clapping in unison. And these studies have been done. I don't know if any of you have done this, but I have a feeling this is a more enlightened, in tune, or, uh, in -tune group than almost any I've seen before. So I'd like to test it. Ready, go.
All right, we picked up most of you in less than a minute. That's actually pretty impressive. Usually groups of over 1,000, it takes a minute to a minute and a half. So what that should tell you is this. Getting people all organized to work together is an amazing thing when it really happens. You're, you, when, when you have a common purpose, a connected goal, and something meaningful, it's amazing. You can do anything you want to do. What if the world weren't powered, though, by 1,600 people? It was powered by 7 billion. I would say the sky's the limit. And all I ask you is, are you ready? Are you ready to participate in this innovation economy? Prove the lives of people everywhere. I think you are. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>